Welcome to today's briefing from Downing Street. I'm joined by Dr. Jenny Harris, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. First, I want to update you on the latest data on the coronavirus response. 2,489,563 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the United Kingdom, including 136,000 486 tests carried out just yesterday. 240,161 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 3,451 cases since yesterday. 10,484 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus, down from 12% from 11,872 this time last week. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 34,466 have now passed away. That's an increase of 468 fatalities since yesterday. This new figure includes deaths in all settings, not just in hospitals. Before we begin questions from the public and from the media, I wanted to remind people of uh, details of the next phase of our fight against coronavirus. Could we have the first slide, please? In order to monitor our progress, we're establishing a new COVID alert level system with five levels, each relating to the level of threat posed by the virus. The alert level will be based primarily on the R value and the number of coronavirus cases. And in turn, that alert level will determine the level of social distancing measures in place. The lower the level, the fewer the measures. The higher the level, the stricter the measures. Throughout the period of lockdown, which started on the 23rd of March, we have been at level four. Thanks to the hard work and the sacrifices of the British people in this lockdown, we've helped to bring the R number down. And we're now in a position to begin moving to level three in very careful steps. Slide two, please. We've set out the first of three steps we will take to carefully modify the measures, gradually ease the lockdown, and begin to allow people to return to their way of life. But crucially, avoiding a second peak that could overwhelm the National Health Service. After each step, we will closely monitor the impact of that step on the R and the number of infections. And we will only take the next step when we are satisfied that it is safe to do so. Step one from this week means that those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can now spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like. You can meet one person outside of your household in an outdoor public place, provided you stay two metres apart. Slide three, please. Having taken the first step in carefully adjusting some of the measures and our advice to people. We have also updated what we're asking people to do, which is to stay alert, control the virus and save lives. Because if everyone stays alert and follows these rules, we can control coronavirus by ensuring the R number does not go above one and reducing the number of infections. This is how we can continue to save lives and livelihoods as we begin as a nation to recover from coronavirus. I now want to turn to our plans for the wider opening of schools. At this time of year, GCSE and A-level students would have been making final preparations for their exams while other students would have been enjoying their summer term. If you're one of them, as I've said before, I can only say how sorry I am that this has all happened to you this year. 
the sacrifices that you have had to make through no choice of your own, but the impact that this coronavirus has had on your life has made things so incredibly tough for all of you. It is now almost eight weeks since we asked schools, nurseries and colleges to close for all but a small number of children. Once again, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to all the school, college and childcare staff who've done so much, going above and beyond the call of duty to care for small groups of children, of critical workers, vulnerable children, as well as making sure that there's resources available at home for children to be able to learn and interacting with them, contacting them, making sure that children know that you are there for them. You have simply been outstanding and we're so grateful for what you've done. We have been quite clear all along that we would only start inviting more children back into schools when our five key tests have been met. That position has not changed, nor will it. And it is what is guiding all of our actions. But we do want to see children back in school because we know how much children grow and benefit from being in school. We can now start for planning for a very limited return to school for some pupils, potentially as early as next month. Let me explain how this will work because I know that some people, including Parents and teachers are very anxious about this. If the rates of infection are decreasing, it will give us a green light to get children back into childcare and more of them back into school from the 1st of June. As part of a cautious phased return, those in reception, year one and year six, will be allowed back into school in smaller class sizes. We're also planning to get some secondary school students back, those years in 10 and 12, to make sure that they have the opportunity to come back to school on a limited basis and have some face-to-face -face time with their teachers. We are prioritising these children because they stand to lose more by staying away from school. The first years of school are pivotal for children to develop social and behavioural skills and to learn the basics that are going to have a huge bearing on how well they do in their life. Students in years 10 and 12 were there facing the fact that they're going to be sitting exams next year. And it's vital that we do all that we can to help them succeed and help them do well. It's also particularly important for vulnerable and disadvantaged young people. There are some who would like to delay the wider opening of schools. But there is a consequence to this. The longer that schools are closed, the more that children miss out. Teachers know this. Teachers know that there are children out there that have not spoken or played with another child their own age for the last two months. They know there are children from difficult or very unhappy homes for whom school is their happiest moment in their week. And it's also the safest place for them to be. And it's thanks to their teachers and the support that their teachers give to them that they are safe and that they are happy. The poorest children, the most disadvantaged children, the children who do not always have the support they need at home will be the ones who will fall furthest behind if we keep school gates closed. They are the ones who will miss out on the opportunities and chances in life that we want all children to benefit from, from what teachers do for them and what schools can deliver for them. So we're asking some children to come back from the 1st of June. And we're asking schools to adopt a number of strict protective measures. This includes 
reducing class sizes, making sure pupils stay within these small groups, creating a protective and small bubble around them. Schools will also be rigorous about hygiene, cleaning and hand washing. School staff can already be tested for, vi for virus, but from the 1st of June we'll extend that to cover children and their families if any of them develop symptoms. Track and trace methods will then be used to prevent the virus from spreading. Together, these measures will create an inherently safer system where the risk of transmission is substantially reduced for children, their teachers, and also their families. My department has been issuing full and detailed guidance on how to implement these measures and to prepare for wider opening. We have worked closely with the sector, listening to those who work in the classroom. We will also continue to do so, to ensure schools have the support that they need. It goes without saying that we will be carefully monitoring the impact this first phase has and will use this to guide us when we consider our next steps. This phase return is in line what other European countries are doing to get their own schools, colleges and nurseries back. I know a lot of you will be worried about sending your children to school. Every one of us wants the very best for our children. And I know how stressful this time has been for all families right across the country. I want to reassure you that this approach is based on the best scientific advice, with children at the very heart of everything that we do. Education is one of the most important and precious gifts that we can give any child. So when we are advised that we can start to bring some children back to school, we should do so. So that they don't miss out on the enormous opportunities to learn, to be with their friends, to benefit from everything that their teachers and their schools can offer them. We owe it to the children in order to be able to do that. I'd like to now hand over to Jenny, and then we will take some questions. Thank you. First slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this slide uh, shows our change in behaviours in social distancing uh, since lockdown on the 23rd. It's taken, uh, looking back, uh, indexed against travel uh, earlier in the year, or in the case of rail from last year, so that we get a good comparison of what we're doing now and what we've been doing prior to lockdown. Um, and uh, consistently, and thanks to uh, the public support, uh, you can see that uh, in almost, well, in all forms of transport, uh, we are now continuing to maintain uh, much lower levels uh, of travel. Clearly, heavy goods vehicles, we can see, have been much more active, and we would expect that in terms of supplying all our essential items. Um, and some movement now as people start going back to work uh, on light goods vehicles and cars as well, but consistently staying down, and that will continue to support uh, social distancing as we go forward, and it is important that we continue to maintain that. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide represents our uh, current situation on testing uh, and new cases. Uh, so on the right-hand side, uh, the pink uh, bar, you can see uh, now a sustained increase in testing capacity um, or tests achieved. And the uh, number on the left, 136,486 uh, in the last 24 hours uh, up to today's date. Um, is the highest that uh, has been achieved since we started, and that will continue to expand. So now very close to 2.5 million tests completed in total, uh, and that's right across all the different sorts of testing, uh, whether we're sending them out, doing them uh, in the labs or uh, from satellite uh, locations. Um, the confirmed cases, therefore, despite that increase in testing capacity, and you might expect that we would actually find more cases as we were doing that, Quite reassuringly, although we've had uh, 3,451 new cases confirmed, overall that chart is still 
tending to trend downwards. Um, it, it is a caveat because as our testing increases, we will find more cases, uh, but still trending downwards. And so our confirmed total is now 240,161 cases in the UK. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is the uh, data from hospitals. Um, estimated admissions with COVID uh, on the 14th of May, 736. There's a small delay in getting that data through. Uh, and you can see on the slide on the right that we are maintaining a slow and steady downward trend. If we look back a week ago, those case numbers were 971. Uh, and you can see uh, on the graph that we were up in the thousands at the peak of the pandemic in the UK. And that translates through to uh, right across the UK, on the bottom slide on the right, the percentage of critical care beds which have been occupied by COVID-19 patients. Again, at the peak of the pandemic, over 50% of beds were being taken up, critical care beds. Uh, and on the 15th of May, uh, that was down to 20%, uh, again, down 4 or 5% from the week before on average. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the number of people in hospital with COVID by uh, region and by UK country. Um, we can see very clearly the, the uh, high peak in London with a fairly sharp rise and fall. Um, and in other areas, slightly different shapes to the peak of the um, epidemic as it came through. Uh, some are slightly flatter. Uh, all of them are trending down slowly. So it's really important that we still maintain, despite uh, a slight lifting in these measures, that we continue uh, to practice good respiratory and hand hygiene and continue to socially distance and abide by uh, all the advice and, and rules that have been provided. Uh, but nevertheless, across uh, every uh, region and country, we've got movement in the right direction. And this week, uh, 10,484 people in hospital uh, today or in the last 24 hours, that's down about uh, 1,500 from this time last week. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, sadly, 468 cases uh, of deaths confirmed uh, where individuals have had a positive test with COVID. Um, and we've seen over time that the daily uh, death rate, it varies slightly, but overall, the seven-day rolling average, that uh, orange line coming down, indicates that uh, the rate of deaths gradually as we come out of the uh, pandemic in the UK is continuing to fall down. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jenny. And uh, first of all, we go to uh, Lindsay from Gateshead. As a resident of Gateshead, which currently has the highest rate of COVID infections in the UK, I think the imminent reopening of schools in my area is a very risky decision with potentially dangerous consequences. Why aren't the government taking a regional approach to the reopening of schools due to the significant differences in infection rates across each area of the UK? Surely this would be a safer and more controlled way of easing lockdown. Well, thank you ever so much, Lindsay, uh, for that question. Uh, the issue of schools reopening is vitally important for all children to have the opportunity to come back to school and have the opportunity to be with their teachers. But we're doing this in a very, very cautious and phased way. And if there are concerns about uh, the, the R rate, uh, we will make sure that we sort of look at that in great detail and we'll look at the rate of infection but we have five key tests and it's only if we pass those five key tests that we'll look at that phased uh, return of schools uh, with more children being able to attend. Jenny. Yes, um, so just to add to that, the Joint Biosecurity Centre, which is being established, um, is specifically to look at the granularity of the data uh, and things like the R value and the infection rates and where those uh, infections are happening. Uh, and I think it's probably important to uh, note that for most communities, the R rate is likely to be significantly lower than the national R. And that's because we recognise that uh, there are numbers of infections generated uh, in health and care settings, all of which are being um, strongly addressed. But nevertheless, it perhaps gives a slightly 
different picture to the population of what the risks are in communities. Um, and the R value has been modelled for about seven different return to school scenarios by SAGE. Uh, and the one that's adopted is a, is a very, it gives a very small increase. Uh, and the design of that is to ensure uh, that we can continue to keep those R values down to safe levels. But they will be reviewed uh, with increasing granularity of data as our surveys and our uh, testing comes back. Uh, thank you. Next, we will go from, to Lee from Maidstone. Uh, and Lee has asked, given that the NHS has confirmed that over 25% of people who have died in hospital of coronavirus were diabetic, will the government review who should be on the shielded list? Should people with diabetes now be added to that list? And Jenny... Yes, very happy to answer that one. So I think the data which the NHS put out is obviously very important data, uh, but what it was doing was looking at individual-specific diseases without perhaps taking into consideration some of the other uh, risk variables, the other factors that uh, each individual patient with diabetes had. So, for example, we know that uh, individuals who are obese uh, will have a high high rate uh, of type 2 diabetes. Um, we also know that they may have some other underlying health conditions, so they're more likely to have cardiovascular disease and ischemic heart disease, for example. So it's really important that we put all these variables together to understand risk. And in fact, the one that is coming through very strongly in our review of data as it continues to grow is around age. And of course, we also know uh, that diabetes, the proportion of the population with diabetes continues to rise with age. So in answer to the last question about the shielded list, we are actually reviewing all of these different risk factors together to try and give a much more proportional representation of who might be at risk and of course actually uh, diabetes type 2 diabetes not type 1 is one which many of us in the population can perhaps do something about to reduce our risk uh, so uh, again a, a great plug from a public health doctor perhaps to uh, during this pandemic think think about a diet and exercise uh, and what you can do to help there thank you jenny and next if we can go to branwin from the bbc the BMA, the British Medical Association, says cases are not dropping fast enough to reopen schools. If that's still their view in June, will you be comfortable ignoring the UK's doctors? And where local councils are saying to schools they don't have to open, should school governors be listening to them or to you? Well, thank you ever so much, Branwyn, for that question. And I'll uh, turn to Jenny to maybe... Uh, add some extra comments on this. Um, we recognise how important schools are in terms of the, the important role that they play in every child's life. And it is understandable then when you're given the advice that there is an opportunity to start opening schools in a very controlled, careful and phased way because of the benefits, the enormous benefits that that delivers every single child, not just in terms of their education, but in terms of their emotional welfare, their physical welfare as well, we should be looking at doing that. But we will look at all advice that uh, we get, and that is why we put the different thoughts as to how we bring schools back to SAGE to ask quite, quite clearly as to whether how that fits in terms of their modelling and actually how that fits into the whole roadmap that the whole government is doing in terms of not just schools but right across industry and everything else because it's not just something that can be seen in isolation it has to be seen in the totality of what's doing but I would hope that any school wherever it is in the country actually puts at the heart of what it does is making sure we're delivering the very best for every single child in this country and making sure we do everything we can do to give them the opportunity to get back into school, get learning, having the benefit of being with their teachers once more. But we will be working not just with local authorities, not just with uh, unions, but all representative bodies to work with them to make sure we help them to bring all schools back. 
Jenny, I'm not sure if there's Thank anything you. further yeah. you want so, to say. So I was thinking, as, as a doctor advising government, I'm going to be very disappointed if they're not listening to doctors, but that might be for, for me to cope with. Um, I think the important thing is the government uh, advisory group, SAGE, has uh, inputs from a huge amount uh, of not just medical professions, but statisticians, modellers as well, but very, very strong input from doctors all around, both in clinical practice uh, and in academic units. Um, and a uh, very considerable thought, uh, modelling and consideration of behavioural aspects as well has gone into the advice around schools um, with a number of different, as I've said earlier, very, very different scenarios modelled, for example, on age um, and uh, timing, all sorts of things. So I, I think, obviously, it's important that if other groups, whether it be the BMA or, or other medical groups, have additional information that they uh, feel should be, you know, may have been missed or needs to come into that consideration, uh, I'm sure SAGE uh, and government would be very keen to see that. I think the important message on the evidence that we have for children is there are two, two groups at potential risk here, I think. Uh, one are the children. We know that um, we think children probably have the same uh, level of infections. We're just coming through that data now with the ONS survey but they definitely don't get as ill. We re very rarely see uh, children in hospital in proportion, you know, proportion to uh, the older population, for example. Um, and for younger children as well, evidence is still growing, but there may be some evidence there that they are less likely to pass it on. For teachers, again, it's difficult because obviously we've had lockdown, but uh, some high-level uh, sort of signals. Uh, if you look at the ONS death rates, for example, uh, the teacher, teaching profession on that, they're quite crude data, so we have to look at it carefully, uh, but very low, actually, in comparison to a number of other different professions or, or work areas. So I think we've got a number of signals that say this is a, a safe place to go, and then coming to the numbers of cases in our population, um, I think the perspective is we do need to keep them down. We need to actually track them now as they're dropping and really get on top of it. It's a great opportunity. But uh, the latest ONS data suggests that maybe uh, last week there was about one in 400 people with infection. Another couple of weeks, that's halving at our current reduction rate. So that's going to be maybe one in 100. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, w other way around, rather. It will be half that rate. And so I think uh, parents and teachers should not be thinking that every uh, school is likely to be swarming with cases. We're moving in quite a different direction now. Thank you. Uh, Branwyn, I'm not sure if there's a follow-up question. School governors. And on that point about the school governors, they are going to be thinking about their legal responsibilities in terms of making each school safe. How are they meant to reconcile that conflicting advice they're getting from you and from local councils? Well, our guidance has been quite clear. We've made it uh, absolutely clear that there's a set of five tests that we are going to be judging as to the, uh, the opening of additional year groups for schools and if we pass those five tests then we'll look at opening schools up more uh, from early June, uh, from the 1st of June. But what we would ask them to do is look at the guidance very, very carefully and uh, recognise the fact that we are there to provide the very best for every single child who goes to that school. And the best way of doing that, the best way of protecting children, the best way of giving them the best opportunities in life is actually to have them coming back into school. And this is a very small tentative step in what I believe is the right direction if we pass those five tests. But it's been done incredibly cautiously with the welfare and the interests of children and those who work in school absolutely at the heart of it. And next, if we can go to Shihab, please, from ITV. We heard yesterday that the R estimate had been revised upwards. Um, can you provide a guarantee that these measures for reopening some of these school years will not re re uh, result in a significant increase in that R value going up? And if you can't, and there is a significant spike in infections, what is the R value at which point you consider reversing the new strategy? So thank you ever so much for that question. And I will hand over to Jenny on the 
uh, our rate specifically. But we put forward a series of suggestions about how we best approach this. Uh, primarily focused in terms of the impact in terms of children and their education. But what we did is we asked SAGE and government scientists to look at the different models that they were, uh, that we were proposing to see what would have the least impact in terms of that R rate. But if Jenny, if you could. Yes, so, um, so the R value is, uh, you'll, you'll see the way it was published yesterday was 0 0.7 to 1. That's quite a broad range under 1 if we're looking at something that is so important. Um, but, uh, and that uh, uh, rate is derived from a number of different modellers. And each modeller will put in, each modelling group will put in a slightly different uh, data. It will process it in a different way. And they're all compared uh, to see, to come out with a broad consensus. So I think all of the models uh, were uh, assured that it was coming out under one. Uh, you are right, it had gone up slightly using that consensus model from the uh, previous estimates. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think they've also been very clear, and, and I have said frequently, we need to be really careful what it is. We've got a number of different R rates. It's a bit like saying everybody in one area ha has the same sort of house because the average one looks like this. We clearly know that we all have very different circumstances, and the circumstances for R relates to where infections are most prominent, and we need to understand the risks of why infections are rising in certain areas. And what we have in there are predominantly three different R values. We have community, which will be most people in their homes, and that's where the ONS data is coming from. That's household data. We have uh, care homes, which have had high rates. They're starting to come down. Um, and we've had hospitals as well. So it's, uh, it's quite difficult. It's really important we keep an eye on it. It's really important that we understand uh, how it is in different areas. But it's also really important we understand what the drivers are in the areas, because it may well not be uh, stopping children going back to school. It may be putting completely different measures into, say, uh, a local hotspot, whether that be a hospital or a care home. Um, and as we get more granular information from the surveys going forward, uh, we'll be able to do that increasingly. So I think uh, going back, without putting ideas into to politicians' uh, uh, mouths, I, I think it's really important we do understand that on a regional basis and look below that top level because we don't want to uh, detract from the majority of children's education, which will set them up for uh, life in employment and actually predict their longer term health outcomes uh, by clamping down perhaps on, on one just for a single area. Uh, Shia, but would you like a follow-up question at all? Yeah, uh, please correct me if I'm mistaken, but you didn't rule out that there might be a significant rise in infections if you open up schools. If you're getting an R value, an average R value across several different uh, bits of research, based on the community, is there a figure based on the community that if it surpasses that you will consider reversing this strategy? So the, the decision for reversal clearly will go back to ministers and, and we do the scientific advice. I, I think what I was trying to say is on the modelling, the, uh, the model that's been adopted, the suggestion of younger children going back to school, uh, it's not just because of the school environment, actually, it's because of the behaviours that go with it. If you pull back a whole load of older children, they tend to get on buses, travel longer distances, have different social interactions. And some of those social interactions are actually far more significant in moving the R value than actually just going back to school. Um, so I think the important thing is we need to understand in each area uh, what it is. So if you had a region where the R value had not come down quite so much, uh, if that was because there was a high population level of disease, then you may well wish to consider uh, what social interventions, including education, but also what we were doing in parks and all sorts of things, what you wanted to do. Uh, and that's why the um, Joint Biosecurity Centre has been set up, to be able to see that. But what I think you wouldn't want to do is this, uh, for a very small change in R, which is predicted from uh, opening up schools in the way that they have, a very, very small amount on top of this, uh, you wouldn't want to stop children's education when actually the right interaction would be to manage an outbreak in a care home, for example. So I think it will depend very much on the circumstances as we move forward. And just really to emphasise, we've taken the most cautious and precautionary approach to this. And, and the reason that we've set up the 
COVID alert level system is really to guide uh, not just government but also to the public of the challenges and the changes as we fight this virus. Uh, if I can next go to Tom Rayner from Sky. Tom. Thank you, Education Secretary. Two questions, if I may. Sure. Um, beyond increased hygiene measures and reduced class sizes, is it the case that children in reception and year one will not be expected uh, to socially distance when they interact with classmates in the classroom? Uh, and secondly, there will, of course, be millions of children who will not be going back to school uh, for many months. So what are you going to do to ensure better national coordination and support uh, to make remote learning more effective and to ease the burden which is currently falling largely on the shoulders of individual teachers and parents? Well, thank you very much, Tom, uh, on both those questions. So what we're doing is we're proposing a whole range of uh, different things that we want to see happening within schools. Uh, we want to make sure, firstly, we will not be bringing schools back unless we've satisfied the five key tests. Uh, we've established a hierarchy of controls, making sure that people are staying at home if they are symptomatic of coronavirus, making sure that there's a proper hand washing and hygiene mechanisms within schools, making sure there's an incredibly thorough cleaning mechanism uh, within all schools. Um, but a key element of it, as you rightly put on, is about uh, minimising contact and minimising mixing and that's why we've gone uh, in this initial stage of much reduced classroom sizes uh, down to a maximum of 15 and we've looked all the way across Europe as to see how this best works and we've seen some very good examples in nations such as Denmark where it seems to have worked very very well and what we're doing by doing all of these things making sure that there's proper hygiene meth, uh, sort of a uh, proper hygiene in place in terms of children and all those who are working uh, within the classroom. We're creating a protective bubble around them, reducing the amount of mixing, making sure that those small groups stay together, almost like a family within a classroom. And by reducing the amount of contact that they have with other children and uh, with other teachers as well, we dramatically reduce the risk of them being in a situation of uh, getting coronavirus and making sure we continue to keep transmission low. Jenny, I'm not sure if you can um, add, and then I'll come back on the home learning element. Yeah, I, I, I mean, ex exactly as you said, I think underlying all of these interventions are some broad public health principles, which we're all trying to do. We're trying to reduce the number of social interactions we have, but we need to do that in a balanced way. So on the the sort of adult side, we've, we've said we can uh, go outside more. We know that's a, a reasonably safe environment. For children in these environments, you look and say, what are these hierarchies of control that you can do? So good respiratory and hand hygiene, absolutely important. And in fact, teachers are brilliant at uh, getting kids to do things, usually in my experience, far more successful than parents. Um, and they can get them to wash their hands systematically. So this is actually a good educational learning place for all sorts of uh, hygiene interventions. But I think importantly, as the Secretary of State has said, this idea of having a small group where you're, you have interaction, you've increased the level of interaction a small amount, but it's contained, uh, and, uh, and therefore children are benefiting from that, uh, but it's not uh, exponential, if you like. But even so, even within a classroom, although we recognise small children will run around and interact and we expect them to, you can still distance, and I know this is the plan, for example, work desks. Uh, can be distanced and in fact a child rushing past another one uh, in, a, in a normal sort of player is probably not much of a risk. It depends but if they were sitting directly opposite each other in a very small space close together for a long amount of time that might be more of a risk. So all of the interventions are designed to minimise those while still allowing children to learn. And Tom, if I can pick up on your second question about how we're supporting children and families. And again, to take the opportunity to thank so many within the teaching profession for the amazing work that they have been doing in terms of supporting children as they learn at home. There is no substitute for a child being in school and having 
the amazing opportunity to sit in front of their teacher, be inspired by their teacher, uh, be motivated by their teacher. And that's why, quite understandably, we want to see uh, when the time is right for children to be able to return back to the classroom. But we've already seen a number of interventions that we've already made. We've set up the Oak uh, National Academy. This is something that's only been going for three weeks and we've already delivered six million lessons through the Oak National Academy, a truly transformative experience, delivering brilliant education into the homes of so many. But equally, we recognise as children from really disadvantaged backgrounds that actually maybe don't have access to the internet or computer resources. That's why we're spending over £100 million making sure that we can get laptops out to some of those, uh, you know, some of those children that have really been suffering uh, as a result of not being in school and not being able to learn and being supported by the internet. And we're looking at a whole package of other measures that we're looking at how we can support children to learn. And um, whether they're at return to school and we're wanting them to catch up on some of the things that they've missed, or whether they're not in that uh, fortunate enough position to have been able to have returned to school. Uh, if I can move on to David from the Sunday Express. David. Thank you. Uh, Secretary of State, so one of the great hopes of your government was to level up society. What does the future hold for children who go to special schools? Is it realistic to think that social distancing can be enforced? And what help will there be for teachers to make up for lost time and ensure that these children aren't left behind? And will you run special classes for all vulnerable children in the summer? And given that teachers are so concerned about the risks of returning in June, is there a possibility that you'd consider starting the next school year in early August? Um, so thank you, David. Uh, there are currently no plans to start the new school year in uh, early August, but what we believe in terms of our phased, gradual, cautious approach to children returning to schools, uh, this is something that I very much hope that both teachers and, of course, parents and children have real confidence in. You raise an important issue. We got elected on an agenda of levelling up right across society and there is no better way of levelling up for, you know, whether it is children or adults than through education. Education is the greatest leveller and what we will be doing and the department has been doing an enormous amount of work over the last few weeks about how we really drive that agenda forward, making sure that people do not miss out as a result of this crisis, looking at how we can make the interventions to support children, whether they're going to special schools, but also whether they're going to mainstream schools, to make sure they benefit from some of the best teaching in the world that is actually done in this country. And we're looking at different uh, initiatives that we could maybe look at rolling out uh, during the summer period. But if you'll forgive me, I'll probably not uh, uh, divulge those just at the moment as we just have a little bit more work to do on them. Uh, David, I'm not sure if there's a follow-up question there. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it, teachers are so worried that they refuse to go back to classrooms. Is there a genuine risk that they will face disciplinary action? And if gaps in the workforce cannot be met, would you consider granting head teachers new freedoms to hire graduates to fill those gaps? And there is this one thing that's been puzzling some parents. Um, because the government has said that groups with important exams next year are to go back first, why is it that year six, which will not have exams next year, are going ahead of year five, who are looking ahead to sitting their sats? Well, th thank you, David. Well, one of the key reasons that year six was chosen is there a key transition year as many of those children uh, will be moving on to their next phase of education by going to secondary school. And we felt it was important for them to have an opportunity to be able to go back to school, uh, finalise some of them, their study, and be ready to move on to their next stage of their academic career. Um, we are working with all the teaching unions and right across the sector to give people the confidence about the importance of returning to school and every teacher understands that there is no substitute for a child being in a classroom, being taught by them. 
They are the ones that make a difference to a child's life. They are the ones who will inspire and motivate them to learn and want to learn, to be hungry for more, to be able to achieve the maximum. And we'll continue to do all we can do to make sure that as many children as possible, only when it is the right time, get the opportunity to be in a classroom and we'll work right across the sector to make sure that that happens. And I look forward to working with all uh, uh, parents, children and of course teachers to make sure that we're getting the very best for children uh, right across the country. If we can next go to Brendan uh, from the Mail on Sunday. Brendan. Um, Secretary of State, you, you've made the point about the uh, the fact that the most disadvantaged children are perhaps the ones who are really suffering from at the moment from, from not being at school. In your discussions with the union leaders who seem to uh, not wish to return on, on from June the 1st, are you worried that they they don't understand that or that they're prepared to sacrifice that? So, so Brendan, um... I think everyone, and we've seen it over the last few months, you've seen teachers going above and beyond in terms of actually supporting children, making sure that schools are open up every single week, open up, uh, opened up over the Easter holidays, on the bank holidays, supporting the children from some of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable backgrounds, and also supporting the children of critical workers. And every teacher, every teacher I've ever spoken to understands absolutely clearly, absolutely clearly, that actually a child in school, especially if they're from some of the most disadvantaged backgrounds, from the poorest backgrounds, they achieve so much more by being in school. They absolutely thrive. They uh, get so much more from life. It is one of the best places as part of their life in order to succeed and grow. And I think teachers understand that so incredibly well. But the one thing I would say, not just to unions, uh, but to all organisations that represent schools and governors, my door is always open. I'm always keen to listen and talk to them. I've been meeting both representative organisations of uh, school groups, but also unions every single week, not just during, uh, since the schools were closed, but actually beforehand as well. And I always want to talk. We want to find practical solutions to make sure that those children from that most disadvantaged background don't lose out as a result of this crisis. And I hope that everyone is unified in that mission to deliver that. Could I, could I just follow uh, that up course, and Brendan. say, are you, yes. are you saying then, therefore, that from your experience, the teachers, or many of them, don't agree with what their union leaders are saying? Well, and therefore they should, you would like them to appeal to teachers to, to, to go back to school and open schools and, and in a sense ignore what, they, what their union leaders are saying. Well, Bre Brendan, um, teachers have been absolute heroes all the way through this crisis. They have been leading by example, they've been going into school, they've been running uh, lessons, um, you know, uh, not in the classroom, but reaching out into people's homes. Uh, they understand the importance of schooling. They understand the impact that they can make on children's lives. They understand and know the importance of what they're doing and how they can change the lives and the life chances of all children, especially those who are most uh, disadvantaged. But I would say to all teachers, thank you for what you're doing. Please keep doing what you're doing. And I want to work with you to make sure that we continue to deliver the very best for all of our children. Um, if we can go on to uh, Nigel uh, from the Sunday Mirror. Nigel. Uh, yes, Secretary of State, um, primary school teachers are predominantly women. How will they be expected to go back to work when there won't be any childcare available? And to Dr. Harris, if I may, children will be allowed to take their own lunch boxes to school, but not their own pencil cases. What exactly is the difference? Um, so, um, you're, Nigel, you're absolutely right to highlight the important need that uh, many teachers, uh, especially in primary school, uh, well, across uh, all school sectors, have in terms of 
uh, needing an education for their children. And you'll have probably noticed the guidance that we issued on the 24th of uh, March of this year, which actually included uh, teachers and all those who work in schools as critical workers. So those teachers, those teaching assistants, uh, those who work within the school environment all have access uh, to, um, to education provision for their children. Jenny, if I can hand over so, to you. So that, that's quite an interesting question. I haven't had that one before. So the, the basic public health principle is uh, you want to keep everything as clean as possible. Uh, touch points, if you like, so the things we normally think of, door handles, those sorts of things, wiped down and cleaned frequently. I think the thing in a uh, children's environment is there are certain things that you can control uh, pretty well, which might include uh, pencil cases and uh, things that you use routinely during education. Education. Uh, and by doing that, the schools can provide them and ensure that they are maintained clean. The issue about lunch boxes is they're quite personal to the child eating the lunch, and I can almost guarantee that one child won't want to eat the lunch of the one sitting, hopefully, two metres distance from them. Um, and uh, actually, when you're eating, you're also putting your hands up to your mouth and to your face. So there is a differential there around risk, both on uh, what individuals need and what the school can supply uh, and on managing the hygiene around it but I mean for both of those it's really important that both of them are kept as clean as possible and uh, that good hand hygiene particularly is done so encouraging children to wash their hands uh, before and after their eating as well. Thank you so much and can I thank all of you for taking the time to listen in and please do stay safe. Thank you.